Test, test. Are, no, are we live on there? They're, they're hearing all this though, right? All right, everybody, thank you for joining us this evening. How's everybody doing? Good. <laughs> so, uh, as you notice, I'm not Pastor Fry. Uh, he is uh, in Withville right now, visiting family, taking advantage of spring break from school for the kids. Um, you get me tonight, and we're going to continue on in the James study that he's been doing for the past few weeks. But before we do that, um, I'd like to ask if there's any prayer requests that anybody has. We can go over. I have some that have been submitted through Connect cards, and we'll do some of those as well. Um, but does anyone have any prayer requests? Everybody's good, I guess. Before I go too much further, I want to thank Jonathan, who's in the booth tonight. He is the one that's taking over the roles that I normally do on Wednesday, making sure that there is a, a live stream going because it's a little bit hard to do both that and be up here at the same time, so thank you, Jonathan. He's also doing about 50% of our live streams on Sundays as well, so I know sometimes Pastor will mention my name, and sometimes it's Jonathan up there, so I want to make sure he gets his due as well. And then Linda helps us up there. We have a great tech team, so they're doing a great job helping out and making sure we can do live streams and everything else we do here. Um, all right, so last call for prayer requests. Uh, Jonathan, has anyone put anything on the live stream that you can see? Okay. All right, well then, I will pray us in, and we will get started. Uh, Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this opportunity for us to gather in your house, Lord, uh, both those who are here physically, Lord, and those who are joining us in your house online, Lord. I just pray that you be in the midst of us. I pray that you be with me tonight, that you just allow me to say the words that you've given me to go over this study, Lord, um, that I will express exactly what it was that James intended by putting it in there, and that you put in his heart and through the Holy Spirit, Lord. Um, there are some requests uh, in our church that I want to bring before you. Uh, first, I want to pray for Jeff Seddon. I just pray that you be with him throughout his cancer treatment as he needs strengthened by you, Lord, that you give him a touch, a touch of you, Lord, that you're able to be the great physician, that you're able to do more than we can ask or imagine, that he will be feeling strengthened day by day as he goes through that treatment and as he'll be fully recovered, have complete recovery, and they'll get the report that no cancer and he will not have to deal with it any longer, Lord. We just pray in expectation of what you're doing in his life. We also pray for Karen German, uh, Stephanie George's mother. And we know that she's been going through cancer treatment for some time, Lord, and she's on the recovery end of it now. So I just thank you for what you've been doing so far. I pray that you continue to, to be with her as she goes through that, that you strengthen her body. I know that she's been having numbness in her hands and her feet recently, Lord. I pray that you uh, give her full recovery, give her strength, let her feel her, her hands exactly as they're intended. Let her feel her feet exactly as you intended as well, Lord, and reduce the dizziness that she's been seeing. Give her straight vision, Lord. Allow her to be able to see things clearly, not have the world going tipsy-turvy around her. We just pray this in expectation, knowing that you're able to do all of this and more. Uh, Lord, I want to pray for Jack and Caitlin Jones. Uh, we recently found out that they were diagnosed with COVID, Lord, and we know they weren't here in our physical presence, Lord, but we just pray that you be with them, Lord. That we know this COVID disease, for each person, it's a little different. Some people have mild cases, other people have more serious cases, and we know that you're able to help them, Lord. There have been numerous people in our church that have had it over time, um, and they've recovered well, Lord. So I just pray that this is another circumstance where people will, will recover, that Caitlin and Jack, they will be doing well. We'll hear that report that, that COVID has left their body. They're no longer contagious. They're no longer feeling anything. They're strengthened. They're not having any fog. They're not having anything else, Lord. We pray that knowing that you're able to do it. We plead the blood of Jesus over this situation for them, Lord. Lord, I want to pray for uh, Brian Hayes. Um, he's been feeling some anxiety just with everything that's been going on in this world, um, from his own COVID case that he had uh, back a few months ago, Lord. I just pray that he is able to not worry, Lord, that he realizes that there's stability in you, that you're able to grant him a peace that surpasses all understanding, Lord that when he's feeling anxious, he can look at you, set his eyes upon you, and know that that's where his help comes from, Lord, that he will be able to focus on you and all of these things, and that he will be delivered from it. And Lord, I just pray that as we go into this study tonight, once again, that you be with us, open up our hearts and minds to hear what you would have for us, Lord, and just guide us throughout this study. Let us understand exactly what it is that you would have us have tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so like I said, we're continuing the James study. Um, 
Last week, Pastor Fry went over James 2. Um, some of the things he was talking about in there is partiality, so avoiding treating people different based on their status. Um, we talked a little bit about those folks that uh, maybe wealthy folks versus poor folks and um, different aspects, maybe celebrity status, things like that that may lead you to just treat people more partial to one another and how the scripture tells us that we're not supposed to look at people that way. We're supposed to treat them the same, just in the same eyes that the Lord sees them in. Um, we also talked about that famous verse in uh, verse 17 about faith and works, um, often phrased as faith without works is dead. Um, how the evidence of your faith should be that there are works in your life that you can see that you are doing the things that God has called you to. So we talked about that. And then, uh, so throughout James, we're seeing that there's a theme of our actions mattering. And our faith isn't just about what we believe or what we say, but it's actually what we're putting into practice. And that's a choice we're making day by day to carry on our faith and really um, make sure that's evident in what we're doing, showing the fruit in our lives that it's not just something we're coming on Sunday and then leaving and nothing has changed in our lives. It's, it's really going to uh, infiltrate every aspect of who we are. Tonight we're going to be looking at James 3. Um, and it's kind of split into two, uh, two different sections in a lot of Bibles. I know in my version there's uh, James 3, 1 through 12, which is called Taming the Tongue. And then J James 3, 13 through 18 has the heading Wisdom from Above. So we're going to do it a little bit differently tonight and still the same as Pastor Fry is doing in some ways. We're going to read through that whole heading section first. And then we'll go through it a little more scripture by scripture like we've been doing. But I think it's good to get that whole context of that at least heading um, so you kind of know where we're going throughout it. And then we'll come back and, and look at the, the verses individually. So we'll be in James 3, 1 through 12 to start out with. So James starting in verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things." How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, straining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. James is getting intense in a lot of that. Some of that language is pretty harsh, and we're going to get into <laughs> some of that right now, but I just think it's stunning as you're going through it all, just how intensely he's talking about the tongue and what it means and what it can, can lead to in our lives. So I think, uh, I think Jonathan will pull up scripture as he can throughout, but obviously he's doing multiple jobs up there like I normally am on a Wednesday, so he may go back and forth. But uh, starting with verse 1, um, we see there he's talking about not many of you should become teachers. And we, we think, you know, there's a lot of times in scripture where we're instructed to teach others, and then we get this suggestion that, not many of you should become teachers. And, and what is that meaning exactly? And what he's really trying to instruct us is you're going to be judged with greater strictness, that there's a higher bar that you're setting if you decide to, to become a teacher. It kind of reminds me of uh, when Jesus is talking about how unbearable it will be for those who cause the children to stumble. Um, another area we can think of with, when it comes to teachers, because a lot of what they're doing on a daily basis teaching is parents. Um, they have children around them, and everything they're doing is instructing them up on how they should go. So I think parents are held to a stricter standard as well when it comes to their, their, um, their children. So that's something we need to be aware of. And I also think that the, if we look at our own lives, if we think of back when we were in school or in other, maybe it's a Sunday school teacher, maybe it's the pastor teaching, they kind of set the barometer on what we think and believe sometimes. Um, you can do instruction on your own, but if you look at them as someone that you're supposed to be looking at for guidance and they're telling you a certain thing is the way it's going to go, 
you often are willing to just accept that or, or you believe that they have the best intentions. That's why, you know, a lot of times you hear now people are all upset about something that's being taught in school. It's because we know if the kids are in there and they're hearing something in that, that school environment, they're going to just accept it as truth because that's what's on the test, that's what they're learning, that's the knowledge they're supposed to have. And those teachers, whether it be in whatever setting, Sunday school teacher, pastor teacher, or the teacher in school, are going to be held to that stricter standard on the places that they're guiding people. We know that's even more important when it comes to the, the house of the Lord, whether it be a, you know, someone teaching a small group, um, someone teaching from the pulpit, that what they're telling you, they're instructing you and telling you how the Lord would have you go. If they lead you astray, then, I mean, they're directing people away from the Lord, and yet they're go- speaking in God's name. I mean, what, what is that saying about them, it's saying about their fruit, saying about what they're doing? And that's why they're held to a stricter standard. We should go into that in humility, realizing if you're teaching other people, instructing them in the word, that you need to make sure that you understand what's being said, that you're not just saying things out of turn that, that could lead people down the wrong path. So then he goes to verse 2. We start getting into um, why it's such a difficult thing to be a teacher. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able, uh, able also to bridle his whole body. So there's an admission from James right there. We all stumble. So he's not saying, you know, you people who are reading this, you're the ones stumbling, you know, I'm perfect, I'm James in Jerusalem, and, you know, sending you this from my high tower. He's saying we all stumble. And he is a teacher, so he realizes as a teacher that he is stumbling as well. That the only people that won't stumble at all would be a perfect man that has full control of his entire body. And we know uh, none of us are that, well, I don't know. Raise the hands if you're a perfect man able to bridle your whole body. Just for anyone watching online, no one raised their hand. At least not in seriousness. Um, (laughs) But we know, um, so it's a mission that we all stumble, and the most prevalent way is with our words. Um, Because he he specifically calls out, if anyone does not stumble in what he says. So your words are where we're, he's saying we are going to stumble. It's going to be very difficult for us not to stumble in what we say. I think any of us in a normal circumstance can, can say that that's, probably evident from our lives. There's things that we mean to say that we forget to say. There's things that we say one way and the person takes it another because maybe we didn't give as much care to to what it was that we were intending to say. We're going to get a lot more into that as we go, but um, only a perfect person has full control over their words. And we know one perfect person that existed on the earth, and that's Jesus. And those are the words that we look through, and in some Bibles are the red letter words. You know exactly which ones that stand out that you know are are for sure the ones you want to be looking at. Um, But the rest of us, we know that our words, we're going to stumble, we're going to make mistakes here or there, we're going to misspeak. Um, But through the Lord, we're going to get guidance, and uh, James is going to tell us a little more how to deal with that. Let me go to verse 3 and 4. These are cool images that he gives us here. So in verse 3, he talks about horses. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. And then we go to ships in verse 4. He says, look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So I think this is cool imagery because and we're talking about big things and these small little elements are controlling their entire direction or whatever path they're going. Um, I think because of current events, the ships one especially stood out to me. How many of you heard about what was going on in the Suez Canal recently where uh, there was... <laughs> A huge ship with all these containers that went off course and basically blocked the Suez Canal for, I think it was five or six days, and $10 billion worth of trade globally was stopped by this ship blocking that that small little path. I think they say that 10% of all global trade in a year goes through the Suez Canal. That just tells you how important that waterway has become. And that one little rudder that they had couldn't stand up to the winds that were going on and everything going on with that ship, they run aground and it stops all of that. I think that just really signifies to us how much just the small things can matter in such a big, huge thing like that. That it would take five or six days to undo something that was done. And then horses were given, their, they're directed for their intended purpose by the bits in their mouths. Now, I, I think to James's original audience, this probably stood out a little more. 
maybe to more people here. I didn't grow up on a farm or anything like that. I haven't been around horses as much. So that example, I understand the concept. I've been on kind of a horse carriage before and seen how they'll lead them with the bits in their mouth. I think we've seen it before, but that one, I think it, especially to his original audience, probably meant a lot more because there were probably more people that had seen horses at that time than had seen ships, necessarily. Um, and then verse 5, he goes into a little more of the tongue. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. So he talks about the boasting of the tongue. And there's a few ways to take that. One thing I think that that can mean for us is this concept that a lot of us have is that we'll overpromise and underdeliver. We'll boast big things. I'm going to do this or that. I'm going to. How many people have a to-do list that's a mile long? You say, you know what? I'm going to start on a Saturday morning. I'm going to get everything on this list done. And then the hours start creeping by, and you're like, I haven't got any of this done yet. We boast and boast about what we're going to get done, and we overpromise and underdeliver. He's telling us we can't, we can't be doing things like that. Our word needs to be our word. We need to make sure that we're speaking in truth. Um, in other situations, we may be setting things up that are going to ignite the fire and lead to issues down the line. When he said that example of uh, an entire forest set up blaze by a tiny fire, it made me think of rumors. You'll hear a rumor start, and someone will say something in, in one corner of a, a community, a church, a school, wherever else, that such and such was doing, you know, this thing over here. Next thing you know, that's spread around everywhere. People take it as if it's the truth, make decisions based on it, potentially. They may confront the person. They may avoid the person. They may uh, decide that, you know, that person isn't worthy of this or that based on some rumor that they've heard. And they're starting to set fire to this person's reputation, to the things that they have um, maybe in store for them. So we have to be extremely careful with what we're doing. Make sure that we're vetting things that we're hearing like that, that we're not going to spread something like that. Realize the impact of our words. Even one word or phrase can have ramifications for an entire lifetime, impacting multiple people. Going back to the teacher example, I think all of us hope that we had good teachers. But has anyone had a teacher that told you something along the way that really, you know, hit you in your heart and really hurt you or something? Um, I know there's examples where I've heard of people where you know, the teacher would, was just blunt with them and said, you're never going to learn a thing here. You know, you just don't have the capability for this. They set these, these limits on you that that person internalizes, and the next thing you know, that's changed the trajectory of their life because they think, I'm never going to be a good reader. I'm never going to be good at, at this or that. Um, Satan does this to us as well. Satan will get in our, our head and tell us, you know, you're never going to get out of this sinful lifestyle. You're never going to get out of, of this or that. And we know if we look at the truth, we look and rely on Jesus, that's not the case. Um, So yeah, so words have meaning. Uh, One of the dumbest phrases that people say that isn't really true at all is, sticks and stones uh, may hurt my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's not true. Uh, Words can have deep impacts on people. It may not be physical. You may be able to try to shrug shrug them off, and hopefully over time you will and not let them become the hindrance, but there are some people that, you know, that can affect them for the rest of their lives. So we'll go to verse 6 now. So in verse 6 it says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. There's intense ramifications of our words for the rest of our being. I think really what James is trying to get at the heart of there is you can be doing, looking like you're doing everything right, and then your words are going to expose you for who you really are. If you're going to keep going down those paths and saying, um, you know, out from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, if you're going to go about eventually what you're actually believing in your heart's going to come out, especially in those times of stress and anxiety, where all of a sudden you're not thinking about what environment am I in, what mask am I supposed to be putting on in this place, You're going to maybe snap at someone or shout out in a way that that you don't intend, and it may reveal what's actually in your heart there and what path your your life is really on. Um, So our our mouth, our our tongue, can lead us down the path set on fire by hell itself. That's scary. (laughs) It's dangerous. It tells you how important it is that we make sure that we're, we're thinking through what we're doing, that we review how we're acting with others, how we're speaking to others, uh, what we're doing on a daily basis. Now we're going to verse 7 and 8. 
For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. So once again, his language is intense here. Deadly poison that comes out of our tongue. Uh, I also think it's notable, and we'll get into this in the second section as well, that he says, everything has been tamed by mankind, but not the tongue. So mankind can't tame the tongue. Alone, we're not going to be able to do this. But what does God tell us? That with him, all things are possible. It's not impossible to do something that mankind hasn't done if we're letting the Lord guide us in that. Through our own power, it's not going to happen. We're not going to be able to tame our own tongues. But through the Lord, through his Holy Spirit, through his guidance, we're going to talk about the wisdom in the second section as well. Uh, that's when it becomes possible to actually tame your tongue and to be able to, to you know, say words of blessing versus words of hurt. Speaking of words of blessing and hurt, that's where we get in verse 9 and 10. Verse 9, With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. So what does that tell us? If, you know, we're going to be blessing the Lord out of the same mouth that we're cursing the people that the Lord made, the people that the Lord cares about deeply, the people that the Lord wants to see in eternity with him. Now, it's easy for us to say that and look at that when it comes to our brothers and sisters in Christ, because we hope that they're living lives that are also committed to the Lord, so it's easier to speak highly of them and to not be cursing them or, or thinking poorly of them and letting those words be said. It's a lot harder when it comes to the world. People out there that, you know, we have a tendency to think, if we're not careful, if we don't humble ourselves, that, you know, I have Jesus, I'm above them, I'm beyond them, that uh, they are just, they're so sinful that I can't have that compassion for them. But we know that's not what the Lord said that he came for. He came to save the world, not to condemn it. That he wants to see all of those people in eternity because they were made in his likeness. Now our goal should be to have compassion on them, to have empathy for them, and try to lead them to the Lord. We know that if, they, if people stay down sinful paths, that they will end up in hell. That that is the eternity that it, that's set out for them. But while they're on earth, we still have the opportunity to try to lead them to Christ. No matter what, no matter what evil they've done. We look at the story of Paul. He was going around killing Christians. I mean, murder in, in human rankings, even though God sees all sin the same, in human rankings, we often tend to elevate murder pretty high. And he was going around killing Christians, making sure that they weren't going to be able to spread the gospel themselves. And yet the Lord met him on that road in a blinding light and delivered him so he could go and spread the gospel throughout the la land and that more people would know the Lord through Paul's ministry than maybe anyone else at that time. He brought so many Gentile believers into the faith while it had been mostly a Jewish church before that. I mean, what he did, he's the reason, a lot of his ministry is the reason that we're able to be here today. Because unless you're a Messianic Jew, you're, you're a Gentile. So it was really that ministry that, that Paul was doing after Peter had gotten that confirmation from the Lord that it was approved, that is, is how we got here today. And he started for such, such origins that, that would be terrible and we look at it. I mean, can you imagine if some of the people we see uh, in our current society, people that maybe are serving life terms in prison for, for terrible things they've done, they are redeemed by the Lord and they can then be spokespeople for what he's doing. But if we give up on them, if we don't see them in the likeness of God, if we always you know, cast curses on them, then what opportunity will they have to, to know him? He has called us as the church to be his hands and feet, to be guided by the Holy Spirit, to let people know about his love for them. And so it's our task, it's our duty to do that, no matter how terrible in our eyes that person may be. We ask for, to see them with the Lord's eyes, and he sees them as his child that needs to be adopted into his family through Jesus Christ. So I think we all need to be careful in terms of, in terms of what we're saying about others. And once again, all of this is easier said than done. I mean, James told us at the beginning, it's extremely difficult to tame the tongue through this. We're only going to do it through the Lord's power. And even then, we're going to stumble because we're human and we are flawed. We just continually, every day, 
We need to seek him and ask him to help us in taming our tongues. Also there, we're talking about blessing and cursing. It reminds me of uh, the, the verse where it says you can't be double-minded. If you're double-minded, you're confused in all that you are doing. Uh, we can't both be seeking blessing and cursing. It's just we're going to be directed one way or another. Um, so we have to be careful with that as well. So to finish out, we're going to look at verse 11 and 12 here. There's a little more imagery on uh, what a conflict this is to try to do both things. So verse 11, does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. So he's just saying these are impossible things to do at the same time. You're either going to view people the way God tells you to view them and speak of them the way that God wants you to speak of them, or you're, or you're going to start cursing them, and it's going to be hard to do both. Because eventually you're going to get caught up in what you're doing, and it's going to be exposed how you truly feel. Um, so continually we need to evaluate ourselves. It's not, it's not an easy task, like we were talking about earlier, but it needs to be done. So before we go on any further, was there anything in those first 12 verses that stood out to anyone else that we haven't talked about? Yeah. Yeah. So Bill was mentioning, um, I think it's verse uh, six. We're talking about the that the tongue is set on fire, and the fact that such a small body part can lead us down a path of of destruction. Yeah. It, he's mentioned it was the strongest verse that he can remember seeing in the Bible and how intense that is. And I would agree. I mean, I think James is really trying to hammer ha down the point that, look, you need to be watching what you're saying. You need to be watching what direction you're allowing your, your mind to wander and for that to come out of your, your mouth. Yeah. Any other thoughts that anyone had on this section? All right. So we're going to go to this next section now. Wisdom from above is the heading that uh, my... Uh, ESV had for it. So we're going to be looking at James 3, 13 through 18. We're going to read that all, and then we'll go back through it verse by verse. Starting with verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So we can see in those connected, one thing that I think is always important, we're looking at two headings tonight, but when these were written as letters, there weren't these headings that we've put in over time. There weren't these verses identified, or these chapter markers. They were reading this all together. And I think you can see this wisdom from above is directly connected to what he's talking about when it comes to the tongue, because it's this wisdom from above we have to have if we're going to be able to tame that tongue, to be able to, to see people the way that the Lord would have us see them and speak about them the way he would have us speak about them. Um, so he's providing that answer to what we can do about that problematic tongues of ours. In verse 13, uh, take this one by one. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. So I think that first verse, it's harking back to that faith and works conversation we were having uh, last week. Because it's our wisdom being shown not through lofty ideas in our head, or the things we're just thinking about, but our actual actions. I think that's, in a lot of ways, what you can see the difference between wisdom and knowledge. You can know a ton of things. I could know how to repair something but, and have every step in my mind and know what it is, but it's a different thing to go in there and actually go up to something and, and fix it and know all the details and know how to, to go about it and 
you know, if something goes wrong that wasn't on that instruction sheet, what you're doing next, that's wisdom is being able to put it into practice, we're, we're seeing here, to be able to not only know it, but do it. Um, that's how our faith should be as well. The wisdom of faith will direct our works and direct how we're acting in everyday life, how we're going about things. I think the other important uh, word used there is meekness, which is used a lot. We think about the meek will inherit the earth that uh, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and I think it's also misinterpreted a lot, too. We look at meek and we think, you know, weak. I think because those words sound so similar, we think meek and a lot of people think weakness. Um, but meekness is not is not weakness or cowering in a corner, but it's the willingness to be humble. Or another word, another way I've heard it described is power under control. It's, you may be powerful, but in meekness you're willing to submit and submit to the Lord and, and what he would have for you. It's realizing no matter how much power you have that the Lord is the one that you submit to. So it doesn't mean that you're a weak person or that you're weak of mind or, or can't do things. It means that um, you're just submitting everything that you have under the Lord. So I think this entire verse together is telling us that really to show our wisdom and understanding, it's by submitting ourselves to God in all areas of our lives, and that will be apparent from our behavior, from our, condu our conduct on a day-to-day -day basis. So if we submit to the Lord, which is wisdom, then that'll be evidenced by the things we're doing on a daily basis. So then uh, we'll go to verse 14 through 16. Take those ones together. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. Once again, James is getting harsh there. Uh, he's telling us how, how, how deadly that selfish ambition um, and selfishness is going to be. If we focus on what we don't have, that, that uh, jealousy that we have, or only on what we can get for ourselves, the selfish ambition, um, it's not what we're called to do. These things are going to lead to destruction, and not just for ourselves, but those around us. I mean, we just think, you know, the past that people have gone on, the things that have happened for jealousy, wars have been fought over people being jealous of one another. Wars have been fought over selfish ambition that one nation wanted, you know, the land of another nation and wasn't content with, with where it was at. Um, these things drive so much of human behavior, and sometimes we, we trumpet them in some se segments of society as if it's a great thing. You know, uh, there was an era where greed was good, was what people were told, that, you know, you were just supposed to seek after whatever it was that, that you wanted, and that greed was going to be good for, for everyone. Um, we know that's not the case. Um, as a society, as we become more focused on me, 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 we just see the growing rise of disorder and the justification of every action and practice. I mean, how many times are you talking to someone, you're trying to tell them about the Lord or just tell them about some activity that you know is not going to lead to righteousness in their lives, and they're like, well, that's your truth. This is my truth. Because they've decided that, you know, truth is relative now, that we're just going to, you know, you may believe that, I believe something else, and, you know, we can all have our own individual things, and you need to just let me believe that, and if you're imposing on me, you're being harsh and unruly, and that's not, that's not what we need as a civilized society. Um, a lot of times it's because their selfish ambition is leading them to do whatever they want. It, they want something, they believe that's the way it should be, and it's, that's what's dictating what path they want to go on. And when you're trying to correct them in that way, you're stopping that process, and it's removing them from being able to do... Um, can you go back to 16, Jonathan? It's stopping them from the every vile practice that James is talking about in verse 16 there that, that would be justified without this. And the other thing, I mean, would we say that the, Lord, or the world was more orderly when people were trying to care for their neighbor or now when people are kind of setting out for themselves, trying to do whatever. If, if your neighbor's struggling, that's okay. I need to handle my own issues. I mean, I think that just led to more and more disorder that we have in our society. Um, there was a time where I think we all were, were caring a little more for one another because we viewed each other as, as human beings. Now, depending on what someone's political beliefs are, what someone's uh, opinion on you know, a celebrity or anything else, it's crazy what people would divide over. 
and the vitriol that you'll see online and other places where it makes it very easy for people to interact that before never would, it's no longer looking at people in their best intentions, it's looking at their worst intentions and um, seeking out, you may be jealous of them, uh, you may be because you want your viewpoint to be exalted above theirs, and there's all this division that happens. We're called to, be, uh, to go beyond this by using the wisdom of the Lord. We won't be focused on this selfish ambition. We won't be focused on this jealousy. We'll be focused on what he's called us to do. And he's called us to love one another and to care for our neighbor, um, to love our neighbor as ourselves. And as we're doing that, we're not going to be focused as much on ourselves. I mean, I think you see this a lot in some situations that parents will talk about, what they've sacrificed for their children. I mean, that's what he's called us to for, for others on, on this planet with us. Um, a parent may, you know, you hear about the, the desperate situations that some folks are in where, you know, if they're living paycheck to paycheck, there may only be so much money for food on the table. You hear about these parents that, that may make sure their kids can eat and they may, you know, go without because it's just tough times and they've had to make that choice. Um, when you are thinking about others, it's hard to think about yourself because you're so focused on that. You'll be led away from that selfish ambition. You'll be led away from that jealousy because you'll be looking at, how can I love this person more? How can I care for their needs, care for what, what they need? Maybe I'm not focused on, you know, that Lamborghini that I would love to have, but, you know, isn't necessarily going to do much for me. It's just a vehicle, and like all vehicles, it's going to get me from A to B. Um, but maybe I can use funds to, to help someone else or invest in, in ministry or invest in um, stuff that, like, like the Walk for Life that's going on, where we can invest money that we may have used for, for things on our own and invest in a ministry that is going to, to help women to make the choice of, of life. I mean, saving lives with those funds where the folks at the CPC are able to, to field those calls and provide life-saving ultrasound, ultrasounds where ladies can, can see that baby and, and make that choice for life. Um, if we were all just focused on, you know, what was going to advance us and make us bigger and badder and, you know, more on top, then ministries like that wouldn't, wouldn't be able to survive. At the end of the day, I, I really feel like almost all sin can come down to those two ideas of the selfish ambition or jealousy, that no matter what sinful path you're taking, it could come down to those two things. You're lying to get ahead. You know, you're murdering because you're jealous of what that person took from you or, or you want to advance or things like that. Um, you're not honoring your mother and father because your way is better than what they, they had for you. So your selfish ambition and what you would like to do and you knowing the best way is taking you beyond what your parents would, would have for you. Um, I think a lot of, a lot of sin, um, I'll say a lot because I'm sure someone will come up with an example that doesn't quite fit, but uh, can come down to those two ideas resting in our, our hearts and minds if we're not careful. And then verse 17 this is a shorter verse here, but it has a lot packed into it. Uh, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. So this is the conduct that should come from that wisdom from above for us. It should be pure, not with negative motives or, or anything like that. Peaceable, we should be seeking out peace, not seeking out strife and and causing conflict among people. Um, gentle. You know, we know that sometimes for some people we got to, you know, just be a little tougher on them, but gentleness is normally going to be the word that we need to have with someone that's really going to impact their lives. Um, you can be a little tougher with people when you know them well, when you've established that relationship. But if I come screaming up to someone, you know, you are doing something wrong, you need to change what you're doing. They're going to be like, well, number one, who is this crazy person in my face? And I don't know who you are, so I don't know why I'm going to listen to you. But if you're, like, gentle and you've established that relationship with them, you're going to care for them. You, know, you don't necessarily start from day one going, you know, this is everything that's wrong in your life that we need to get done. You, you've shown that you care for them. They're going to be much more willing to listen to what you have to say. And, um, and you can lead them, uh, lead them to know the Lord, um, lead them down the path they need to go. I mean, this is the same for brothers and sisters in Christ. I mean, if we go with a harsh word to a brother and sister in Christ, we may know that they're doing something that they're not supposed to, that it's not what the Lord intends for them. And if we go up to them and just straight up, like, bash them over the head with it, I mean, they're going to think, man, that person's judging me. They didn't care about me. They're, they're trying to say I shouldn't be in the house of the Lord or, or something like that. If we do it with a gentle word, 
they're much more likely to, to listen to what we have to say, view it as edification for their body, and know that we're just trying to lead them closer to the Lord and advance their walk and their, their daily faith so they can have that conduct that comes from wisdom that James is instructing us toward. Um, but like you said, we're all going to stumble. So this is us too. I mean, there are going to be times where uh, we're going to have to receive that gentle word from someone else and accept it and not be going into our own selfish ambition and think, no, I'm good. I, I know what, what I need. I can't believe. Who are you to, to say that to me? If they, they're coming with a pure heart and actually trying to, to better us and they feel it's a, a word directed from the Holy Spirit. Um, next, we have open to reason. I think this is uh, an interesting one because it's really telling us that we need to be you know, open-minded in the sense of understanding people's perspectives, open to the reasoning of where they got to the point that they're at, listening to, to them, not being so, uh, adding those barriers where it's like, we'll, we'll hear one side of a story and we'll just act sometimes. We'll think, you know, I know everything that's going on. I'm going to take this step and, you know, here's where we need to go. Um, when often if we, we are open to reason, open to hearing the other person's perspective, we may find that between, you know, person A's story and person B's story is the truth, that each person's looking at it from their own perspective, and when you get both sides of the story, you can find that actual point in the middle of where things need to be. Um, so we can't be just rushing to judgment there. And then full of mercy and good fruits. Um, I like this one because full of mercy, there are times where we have every right in our human, human mind to to hold someone to something or punish them for some wrong they've done to us. And if we're full of mercy, we're going to people and saying, you know what, I forgive you for, for what you have done. I'm going to be that merciful person that doesn't always try to get even. I'm willing to you know, turn the other cheek and, and take that loss, take that thing that's happened to me and show that person mercy, even though I may be owed something, I may be in the right, they may be in the wrong, but I'm still willing to show that mercy no matter what. Because um, that's what the Lord has called me to, and, and that's going to have a huge impact on people when, when we do that. And then the good fruits should be the result of our lives. A lot of the stuff we're talking about would be the result of good fruits, and people can see this going, going on, but it's that conduct that James is talking about as we started this section. And then uh, James is back to impartiality, uh, which he was talking about uh, in James 2, that we can't be looking at things constantly from... From one side, like it goes back to the open to reason as well. Those go together because if you're open to reason, you're not going to be partial to, to one side or the other. You're going to be listening to different perspectives. Um, but I think this also goes so far as, as when it comes to family. We have to be careful sometimes that, you know, the Lord, uh, there's the encounter where they tell him that his, his mother and, and uh, brothers and sisters are waiting for him. And he says, right here are my brothers and sisters and, and gesturing to the disciples. We're part of the Lord's family now, and there may be times where the Lord is calling us to do things that, you know, are, are for Him, that may not, from a human sense, make, sh make sense for a family. I mean, look at the time commitment that many of us make to the Lord by, by coming to church and getting involved in church ministries and, and things like that. From a human perspective, that doesn't always make sense, because that's time you could be spending, you know, doing things on your own or, or spending with your family, but when you're spending it for the Lord, He's going to bless that and give you even better times with your family, and your family is going to see that and maybe join you in ministry and be blessed by that as well. Um, so yeah, we can't have partiality. We can't um, be looking at rich or poor either. And then sincerity. Um, I think that's, that's critical. It has to be true. We can't be fake. We can't be doing all these things just to look like we're the good Christian. There has to be sincerity in what we're doing. We don't want to put that... I mean... There's this temptation, I think, sometimes to just put the mask up and to make it look like we're the, <laughs> I mean, right now we're all masking up, but uh, the metaphorical mask up to, uh, to look like the, the great person that people expect you to be, to the Christian, but internally to not be that person. All these things need to be sincere in your heart. Um, or you'll go back to what we were talking about earlier with the tongue, where it's going to come out at some point. You can say you're being all of these things. You can look like you're open to reason, all of this, and then eventually you're going to get frustrated at some point, and it's all going to come out. It's all going to come out of that, that mouth of ours that's going to tell us exactly what was in our head that whole time. Um, so we need to make sure that we're always evaluating ourselves and um, you know, asking the Lord to, to reveal to us when we're not being sincere, when we're, we're not showing these, these elements. So definitely, if, if nothing else tonight, I would say go back and look at verse 17, 
and just think through those different elements that he gives us there. I'm going to read them off one more time. Pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. This is the wisdom from above. This is the wisdom that we're seeking. And the best way to have this wisdom is just ask the, the Lord to have the Holy Spirit guide you day in and day out. The Holy Spirit will give you that nudging that will lead you down the path of all of these things. They'll lead you to be more pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy, impartial, and sincere. If we aren't living with the Holy Spirit in our lives, it's not going to happen. We cannot do it under our own power. James has told us that. Uh, Jesus told us that, that things are impossible by man alone. But with God, all things are possible. We just have to seek him and, and allow him to guide us, allow the Holy Spirit to guide us in that. Uh, let's go to verse 18 to finish out this section here. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Now, I think this is an interesting one because it's kind of reversing the order here a little bit. It's talking about the harvest before what you've sown. So if we're reading this in kind of the order that it's talking about, first you have to sow things in peace if we want to reap that righteousness. Um, so we need to be the people who are making peace. Um, people can, uh, Jesus tells us that people will know that we're Christians by how we love one another. Well, one way we can show that we're loving one another is going into situations of strife and chaos and trying to bring peace to it through the guidance of the Lord, where we can help people come to the peace that comes from, from knowing Christ, that their lives that are, I mean, all of our lives can feel chaotic, and then when we have those quiet moments with the Lord and seek out his peace, he can, he can take that anxiety and, and make it go away and give us a peace that surpasses all understanding. Um, so he's called us to be those people of peace. Um, the gospel is often called the gospel of peace, to spread the, the gospel of peace, to let people know about the Lord and extend that peace to them. So uh, I mentioned this earlier, but just as Jesus talked about the difficulty of the rich man to enter into the kingdom of God and then immediately turn to with God all things are possible, we see this turn in the two passage, passages of James, how impossible it is to tame the tongue and then the possibility that comes from seeking that wisdom from above and that'll give you the ability to, to tame the tongue in, in the way that the Lord would have us do it and to see things the way the Lord would have us see things. Um, and the tongue may be unruly and lead to destruction, but its bit or its rudder can be found in seeking wisdom from above and then listening to the Holy Spirit as we are given this wisdom. So mankind can't tame the tongue, but we can seek out the Holy Spirit and it'll give us that rudder of our ship or that bit in the horse's mouth and the Holy Spirit can be what guides us because we're not going to be able to do it ourselves. But, so that is James 3. Any thoughts that anyone has from the totality of James 3 and what we've gone over tonight and in light of other James and other scripture, just your thoughts. Remember the first section, James? Yeah. That last portion of Mike that you said about the two spheres? Yeah. Because I feel like you can also fall into another problem of not only in your thoughts or arrogant saying wrong intentions of your heart and not sincere, but you could also be lost over Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, that's true. Sincerity is sometimes just being clear in what we mean as well and, and letting us um, be honest and sincere with people about what boundaries are um, so that we can make sure that we're not leading to more strife and, and, and things of that nature. I think, um, yeah, yeah, great. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Right. 
Yeah, April was mentioning the contrast of the wisdom from the earth that it's talking about is the demonic one there um, versus the wisdom from above that, that the Lord is seeking us to there. And um, yeah, a lot of those examples from 17, um, kind of as you were mentioning, the different things that can happen when you seek the worldly wisdom, they were almost the inverse of those things. That if you are, are going down the wisdom of the world, that you get insincerity, that you don't have peace, you have chaos. A lot of the, it's almost like the verses of 17, when you're going with earthly wisdom, you just invert every single one of them, and that's what earthly wisdom will eventually lead you down. Yeah, I mean, how many uh, self-help books are, are out there that aren't written from a biblical perspective that are trying to tell you exactly how to live your life, and you can try all those things, and how many people then just get anxiety from the fact that they're trying to now follow the exact rules from this book, this self-help book, and that they can't handle it all, because that's not, that's not necessarily going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit like we are in strengthened every day. That's the only way we're going to get implement in the wisdom from above is the strengthening from the Holy Spirit. All these other books are going to be more difficult for us. All right, well, uh, I'm going to close this in prayer for this section, and then I have some announcements for us, and then we'll, we'll head out. Uh, dear Lord, I just thank you for this time that we've had to, to be in your house, Lord, to read your word together, to seek what it was that, that James was writing to his audience, Lord, empowered by the Holy Spirit, what you sought to, to include in this letter, knowing that we would read it here today, Lord. I just pray that as we leave this place, that you be with each of us to, to tame our tongue, not under our own power, but by the guidance of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we will seek that wisdom from above, that we will seek those, those elements to it, Lord, to be the people of peace that you have called us to, that you will give us the eyes to see people the way that you see them, Lord, that we will talk about them the way that you would have us talk about them, Lord, that we will speak blessings on the lives of others and not curses, that through your spirit we can do all these things, but through our own power we know we are not able, able, Lord. The word tells us that we are not capable of it. So we seek your spirit every day, Lord. We seek your spirit to guide us, Lord, as we leave this place, for each and every single one of us, that we are guided by your spirit day in and day out, that we will feel the nudging that guides us exactly where you want us to go, directs our paths, and Lord, I just pray as we leave this place, be with us, be with our youth that are at the, the bonfire tonight, Lord. I just pray that you allow them to have a good time, you protect them, um, that you allow them to get home safely. I just pray that you be with um, every person who's not here in our church tonight, everyone who is here, that, that you bless their lives, you be with them, Lord, you grant them peace, um, a peace that surpasses all understanding, and that we can show our conduct to be conduct that is becoming of you, Lord, because we're, we're doing it in the wisdom that you have granted us. So be with us as we leave this place to know today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Um, so thank you, everyone. A few minutes here, but I just want to give you some announcements of things that are, are coming up. Um, this Saturday at 9 a.m., we have our men's breakfast. Um, so the guys who are here, you know, a few of us here, um, you are invited. You can come get your Chick-fil-A chicken biscuit and your donuts. Um, have a great time with the guys. I hear we're going to have a, a great relevant word from, from someone that uh, you may or may not have heard from before. So um, I believe that uh, Councilman Cliff Houghton is going to be with us uh, giving the word this Saturday. So make sure you come out and hear from Cliff. Um, and then Sunday, uh, Bishop Travis Gore, who's the Virginia Church of God Youth Director, and he also is an evangelist and, and goes uh, to different churches in the state, um, will be here this Sunday, both for our 1030 a.m. and our 6 p.m. We're doing a special 6 p.m. service, so make sure that you, uh, you join us for both of those. I've heard uh, Bishop Travis Gore before, and he does an amazing job communicating the gospel. I know that you are going to feel blessed. You're going to feel the fire of the Holy Spirit in you, and he's, you may feel convicted, too. I'll be honest with you, and it's good when we feel that convic conviction, um, but, but uh, it's going to be a great time with him. I can't wait to hear what he has for us. And then on April 27th, we have our blood drive from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m., um, please sign up if you can, if you can give blood uh, during that time. It's going to help. Uh, our area has a shortage of blood right now. As we know, that uh, hospitals have been dealing with more this year than they typically do, so they've had more need than ever. Um, so if you can sign up and do that, you can go to our website to, to, to pick a time. Um, anyone who does sign up will get a, a Chick-fil-A card that will give you a free chicken sandwich or nuggets. So you do uh, end up winning in this deal too, so <laughs> make sure to, to sign up for that. Um, and help out the, the Red Cross blood drive. And then, uh, as we mentioned earlier, the Walk for Life is still going on. Um, it is, the virtual walk is May the 8th, 
but um, I think the donations can be taken until May the 22nd. So if you would like to sign up as a walker, you still can. But more importantly at this point, if you want to support one of our walkers, you can go to our website and you'll find a list of the different walkers and you can support one of them. Or just if you want to mark it on a, an offering envelope, you can just put Walk for Life there and it'll be distributed to amongst the walkers once uh, all that's collected by, the, by closer to the, the Walk for Life. Those are the main things coming up. We have more coming up in the end of April and May that we'll hear about here soon. Um, but yeah, that's, that's all for tonight. Thank you everyone for coming, and uh, we'll see you on Sunday, if not before. Worship practice is about to get started, so the worship team, you're going to have a great time with David. Um, but that's, uh, that's it. Thank you everyone. <laughs>